Welcome to He Did This To Me, the sports podcast from a father and son who happen to be mostly optimistic Knicks, Mets, and Jets fans. My name is Nick, a.k.a. Goody, and with me is my old man, a.k.a. the big guy, Noel. And just like his name, all we do is win. Let's get to the show. It's time to begin. The Boston Celtics, they lead the NBA Finals 3-0 to zero against the Dallas Mavericks. A lead that has never been surmounted before. No zinger, no problem. Lots to unpack here. What are you thinking about the NBA Finals so far? I mean, it's very interesting, um, you know, the, because, you know, it's interesting to me because it, it, the um, the whole hot take society we're in, in that uh, Dallas was the flavor of the month for a minute, you know, and, and everybody predicted so much. I heard so many people predicting Dallas. Listen, it's not about crowing that you're right or whatever, but Dallas is not – has not been a great defensive team all year. Yes, they've gotten better, and they definitely perform better in the playoffs. But, you know, I guess everybody, a lot of people, myself included, were kind of kind of got drunk on that and thought that this is their, their, their deal and this is how they play. And you know what? It's not. And we're seeing the real. And this is one point I wanted to make, and I, I definitely thought about last night I wanted to make to you. L- let's stop this talk about, oh, the West is so great and the East is not, okay? Because Boston had the best record this season. And trust me, I'm not here to sing the praises of Boston, the Boston Celtics. Boston had the best record this season for a reason. They're the best team in the league. Okay? I don't think I, – I feel like anybody who was in Dallas's situation would lose the series, not necessarily as badly as they are right now. But that's the point I'm making is just that, you know, let's stop all this consistent it, – it, it, like I said to you about a lot of things, Nick, people say it enough, so everybody starts repeating it. So it becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy that doesn't make it true. You know, and that's what I'm seeing. I've thought for the last few years that the disparity between the West and the East has definitely narrowed a little bit. That gap is not as big as it once was. And I think there's at least three teams that if they're fully healthy and come out of the East would be able to beat Dallas. I don't think that they're yeah. just like, it's not It's not just Boston either. So yeah, I, I definitely don't think that that narrative, and you know what, those things are cyclical. They always are as far right. as, you right. know, back when, you know, in the nineties, the Eastern conference was the better conference for mm-hmm. years upon years. And, you know, then, so those things, they're going to come and go. They're always going to change. But I mean, this series, I will, I have to admit, I was one of those people who I picked Dallas. I thought Dallas would win in seven. I thought it would be a long series. I did think that they had started to step up the defense, um, you know, post all-star break, especially at the end of the season and in the playoffs. And I thought that their offense and shot making, especially late, would give them the edge. Now, if the games aren't close, it doesn't matter, you know, the fact that you have these two guys. And what we've seen is, is, team defense and team ball movement beats great individual players at the end of the day you know if Kyrie has an off game they 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 have a real hard time winning a game if Luca is not quite himself they have a really hard time winning a game whereas we can see Jason Tatum be able not be able to shoot the ball well at all, but they have a guy like Drew Holiday who all of a sudden now he wants to step up. Porzingis was fantastic in the first quarter of the first game, and then since then he hasn't been that great. He, you know, he, his presence it definitely helps. I thought <laughs> yesterday you saw uh, the you, you saw a lot more drives to the basket by Dallas without Porzingis in the paint to be able to protect no the rim, <clears throat> and he gave them what they needed in that first game. He that first game of the series, he came out. He had that fantastic first quarter. He's playing, you know, like the like the unicorn that we know him to be. And the thing that we've always said about Porzingis was. Can he stay healthy? I mean, obviously, we're a little bit more well-versed in him than most people um, just because, you know, he did start off as a Nick. But with him, it's always about whether or not he was going to be able to make it through an entire season and playoffs run. I kept saying for the Knicks to get the highest seed possible so that you play the Celtics the latest in the playoffs possible. But now going into game three, I'm thinking to myself, okay, Porzingis, he's not going to be able to play. Dallas can make this a series. Does this entire series change now that there's no Porzingis? But they were able to come in and dominate that third quarter. They were able to withstand the run that uh, the Mavericks made in the fourth quarter and then able to seal the game down the stretch with no Luka on the court. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Luka, I mean, that's a whole nother subject. This guy... 
You know, and there's another guy, Nick, who we get drunk with this guy, right? This guy's offensive talent is so great. You get drunk with that shit. You look at it, and you're like, wow, wow, wow. But you know what? At the end of the day, Nick, his defense sucks. It's terrible. Sucks. sucks. Terrible. Before you go on on Luca, I got to go ahead and I got to give you some credit here just because now it, the entire national narrative on Luca is the same narrative that you have been screaming for the longest time when it comes to this guy. And now everybody is seeing it. And the crybaby part is something that is now attached to him. And okay. I saw a breakdown today going back to it's not like this is some recent phenomenon. It was talking about when he got kicked out of the game in the um in, in like some sort of European Worlds tournament and he's yelling at some sort of chancellor as he's walking off the floor. The guy's got to get that under control. Obviously, you've been seeing this for quite some time. I mean, yeah. and now everybody sees it. Your boy Luca yesterday, he really cost his team. Oh, absolutely, Nick. I mean, come on. Well, listen, I mean, I got to think it's hard. You know, you put a guy – in a professional league with men from time he's what, 13, 15 years old? Something like he that. Probably, yeah. He clearly probably lived a, I mean, we have to be honest here, he's clearly lived a life of privilege, right? I sure. Mean, why wouldn't he, right? Sure. But, but still, that doesn't absolve him from being a jerk with the refs. And beyond that, you're in the finals now, dude. We cannot afford to lose you. Listen, the, the griping at the refs, uh, listen. Those foul calls, people can argue with them, whatever. But the fact that he put himself in that position, which is what I always preach to you, if you put yourself in that position, then whatever happens, you can't moan about the refs. Oh, the calls they made weren't good or whatnot. Come on, stop that. You put yourself in a stupid position. And then, hey, by the way, these same refs are the guys who are going to be making those calls. And let's just chatter at them all game. And, you know, with the Yang Yang all game. And when they do make a call, do sardonic sit to them. You know, you know that, that, that the refs are probably like, this, you know. I mean, they can hear, you know. And now, and now guess what? Now you're putting it in their hands. Come on. Now bro. you're putting it in their hands. And, I mean, I'm sorry, but that last foul was a clear foul. I saw a breakdown of every foul that he was called for in that game, and there's one that's What was that, the blocking foul uh, on, on – what's his name? On Jalen Brown. At yeah. near half court? What are yes. you doing? Well, what first are you of doing? all, what are you, are you doing right there? Let's also give Jalen Brown some credit for doing something that I don't think enough NBA players do. That's like, correct. there was times with the, when the Knicks were playing against um, – uh, Philadelphia. And I was like, yo, we have to go out and bead more. And he, in that place was like, I am going to put the pressure on the refs right now. And I'm right. going to make them give him, give this guy this call. And it was the correct call. Listen, what he did at the end of the first quarter where he tried, where he, 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 he went down in an attempt to get a foul call on a three point shot. And it, 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 then there was, first of all, I've seen another, I've seen a breakdown of that. There was absolutely no foul. No he stays on the ground. He yells at the ref and guess what? Boston goes down and walks into a wide open three because they're playing five on four. And then he comes down the next play, puts up a bad shot. Now, for Luca, Luca, just about every shot is a good shot for Luca. Okay. So it's hard to say it's a bad shot, but I think it's an especially bad shot because this time he especially was just trying to bait the ref about like saying, Hey, I just put the pressure on him. I just came at him. So now he's going to, he has to call it this time. The right. second time, it was even more clear that it was not even close to anywhere of being a foul. And then it ends up being a jailbreak down the other way. And now Boston dunks. You guys started off hot. You come at them, you throw the punch, and you're only up by one because you one give point. them five points right at the end of the quarter. You come out of the first quarter and you're up by six. You feel a whole lot differently. And the exact opposite is right on the other side for you to watch. When you look at Jason Tatum, Jason Tatum last night had two or three times where he was clearly fouled. That's right. And he finished through the contact on at least two of those three and then looked at the ref like, yo, and then ran down the court. He didn't. He wasn't trying to get the call. He was trying to get the bucket, but then still making his point. And those were actual clear fouls. This guy has totally just made this entire narrative about him. And it's and it's it's strictly because of him and what he's decided to do and the way he's decided to handle himself. From what I've heard, the entire organization has been getting on him about like, yo, trying to get him to chill this out. Jason Kidd can't get through him. You know, Mark Cuban can't get, get can't get through to him. And it's just like, yo, dude, you're a saloon door on defense, okay? You don't box anybody out. You're a fantastic offensive talent. But then you add this other element, which is you not being available for the last four minutes. And 
the way that this has to affect not only you, but your teammates and all that. To hey, again, I got to I got to say, you know, we're talking about player that you really want to start your team with. You look at what he does on the offensive end. Fantastic. But you look at him and his personality being the leader of your team. And then the fact no, that he plays no, absolutely no, no defense. You can't put this guy in that in that conversation. And it's it's crazy how quickly, you know, a narrative can change. And that's exactly what I said when we had that conversation where we were talking to maybe Luca start your team. I was like, Nick, he's a great talent. But is he the guy? Is he the guy you want being your 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 guy out front and, and the guy for pe people to follow? I remember when I said Luca, you said, Oh yeah, how could I forget Luca? I mean, he's a hell of a player. Yeah. <laughs> but I don't think you have him being the cornerstone of your team yeah. for that simple reason. And it, it's just amazing to me that no one can get through to him. And frankly, it's immature. There's no doubt about that. It's very selfish. Very you know? selfish. It's very selfish. But you'll find most people that are adults that act immaturely are also acting selfishly. Sure. But um, it, it's just, it, it's, it's absolute foolishness for this guy to be blowing this opportunity. Because listen, man, these games were possible. Okay, they were they were possible. And listen, Nick, I've seen him at moments play good defense. I've seen him at moments put forth the effort. That's it's, all we're it's all effort. About he has the ability. It's not like yeah. he's got crazy foot. He's not listen. There's going to be some guys that foot speed wise, he's not going to be able to stay in front of. But he could. If Jalen Brunson can be a you know serviceable defender, Luca can be too. That's right. And it's not like listen, man. It's not like he, he's backing off people and he's keeping them between the knees and he's letting them shoot jump shots. Nick, no one's even trying to shoot a jump shot. They're just running right past him. As soon as they see him, they just ring around the rose <laughs> right to the basket. It, it's a joke. It's an absolute joke. And it, it's, it's embarrassing for him and his team. And I got to tell you, like you, we said, his teammates have to be like definitely with the side eye, man. You basically bailed on us this game. Yeah, yeah. I mean, he's basically a cone in a drill on defense. And I saw um, that kid lively. I saw him, they, they, they talked to him and he talked about, you know, Hey, the refs, you know, at the end of the day, like they're not always going to make the call, but there's no time to, you know, have a conversation with the ref. You got to get back down the court. And it's like, it's like Luca, like he, like, like he, he, he time warped and he, it's, he, he's still living in that, in that world where it's right, but right before the all-star break. And, mm -hmm. you know, things are different, man. Like, we saw it with our own team and our own best player. Jalen Brunson had to make an adjustment. And then he was, you know, he, he, he was chirping at the refs a bit too much. And he had to make another adjustment and say, OK, like, you know, I, I can't do that right now. That's not getting me anywhere. If anything, it's probably hurting us. And, you know, it helps when you have your dad right next to you yelling you to shut up and just go play. But, um, you know, Luca needs somebody like that or he needs to figure it out for himself. But your let's also keep. There. Let's us let's also keep in mind this guy is the only person to ever make first team All NBA his first five teams in the first five years in the league and he's still extremely young and I saw you know Brian Windhorst talking about he he went on an all time rant after the game about Luca mm -hmm. and the way that you know Luca let his team down and um, I saw him talk today after you know because Luca did sit down with Malika Andrews today which I thought you know I, I give him I give him credit for doing that he definitely does not mm -hmm. have to do that he's not required yeah. to and um, I think some of that's a little bit of damage control as well and he didn't sure. it's not like he was like uh, you know ah oh, I gotta be better you know he still kind of. He didn't totally own up to to it as much as I would have liked. But I thought one of the other things that Windhurst said that I liked was, hey, you know, I want this to be something where, you know, he's 22 at the end of the day. What is he, 22, 23 years old, something like that? Yeah. It, you know, when he's 25, 26, let's talk about this as, you know, ah, remember that back then. And that was, you know, that, that was a, that was a big, um, you know, learning process for me, you know, similar to the way like a guy like LeBron, when he played against Dallas and he had that no show his first year with the heat in the finals against them, he's getting held in the post by JJ Barea. And now that's a footnote on LeBron's career. Some people, right. it's a footnote that they refuse to uh, forget people like myself. I don't want to hear any LeBron versus Jordan conversation because of that one thing on his resume you, you, to me, they're not even the same conversation just because of that, no matter what he does post. But at the end of the day, man, you know, he 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 continued to write his story and rewrote his narrative. We're going to need Luca to do the same thing. I hope so. As a basketball fan, um, hopefully it's just not, you know, in a final series against the Knicks. Yeah, yeah, really. I'm here to tell you, man, same thing I said about Melo, but even more so with this guy. He needs to get in better shape. He needs to get in better shape. 
I'm sorry. I mean, you, we could say he's doughy and all that. I said that to somebody at work today. And they said, well, I said, who else really ascends? And they just stay with that doughy um, look. And they said, what about Jokic? I said, no, 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 no. You look at pictures of Jokic before he came to the NBA and when he first got to the NBA, he was all heavier. He just, Jokic is not a muscular guy. He's not cut, but he's trim. He's trimmed down for a man that is as big as he is. Luka needs to do the same thing, Nick, because I will tell you this too. He definitely tires going near the end of the game. Uh, on the defensive end, he seems to. But, you know, maybe that's just separate. But he doesn't seem to tire at all when it, once he gets the ball on offense. Then, then the kid's got the energy of, you know, uh, unstoppable energy. But, when you know, it cannot hurt. Nick. He's a professional athlete. He's young. He's 22, 23. That chubby, you know, slightly doughy look. Come on, what are we doing? He's not in the best shape he can possibly be. I mean, that, that's not even that's, close. That, yes, and right. And he's already very, very good. I'm not telling the guy to go pump iron and do all this and become all bulky. I'm saying just, you know, he probably, what it comes down to, Nick, is he has to eat better. He said, yeah, yeah, eat better, eat better, better eating habits, and he could more definitely cardio. do some more cardio, strength and conditioning, that okay. type of stuff. You know, he doesn't see I, I don't think he's the guy that who's doing all d- doing stuff like that constantly. You know, he's mm-hmm. not um, he's not doing like, you know, like like Anthony Edwards has 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 some uh, um, some some posts that he does of his workouts. I don't think Luke is doing that type of shit. OK, he's he, he not doing that type of shit. Um, Drew that Holiday, not man. hurt. Yeah, yeah no. not, not hurt. Uh, Drew Holiday. That dude is such a winner. I mean, he's just he just Come plays on. winning basketball, makes winning basketball plays cool. and an all time horrible trade by the Milwaukee Bucks. Not only to give up this guy who he was the one who came to your team and made you a championship level team. Mm-hmm. He was the one that put them over the um, o- over that precipice and got them to that point. But in addition to that, you, 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 you and I remember you saying this at the time, you trade him to a team that's clearly going to just buy him out. And now you allow Boston, your biggest rival in the Eastern conference to be able to go and scoop him up. Listen, a lot of people thought the idea of Dane Dalla and, um, you know, Giannis together was going to be so dynamic offensively, but as we've seen, it's not it's like we, like I say all the time, you're not playing 2k. Okay. You can't just, just, right. just plug and play and you lose a guy who offensively always makes the right play. Defensively, he is best in class, probably the best guard defender in the league. Mm-hmm. And he has a mindset and a work ethic that permeates throughout the year entire team. And you put that in, you take that and you say, okay, but this guy scores 25 a game, but he doesn't have any of those other intangibles. And you see where that gets you. Right. You know, I, I just I'm just impressed by him. I've always been impressed by him. Always thought he was a great ball player. And, you know, I, I'm glad that he's been able to get some shine here in these finals. Yeah. Holiday's a man. He's played very well. Um, you know, he's one of those guys you got to have on your team. And he's not just a defensive guy. So where he's an offensive liability, he's very good. No. offensively. And no. he, he, he like you said, he plays winning basketball. He finishes well around the basket. He's smart with the basketball. Very steady. Almost never turns it over. You know, I mean, come on, man. The guy, he's a winner. He's a winner. And, you know, we get too caught up in the shiny object sometimes, you know, and the shiny object isn't always a winner. Like we spoke about with Dame. I love Dame. But let's face it, Nick, you know, like we've talked many times years past that, oh, we want Dame, we want Dame, we want Dame. Dame is a good player, but he's not that great defensively either. No, he's terrible defensively. Okay, so let's say we had gotten Dame instead of Brunson. I don't, yeah, I mean, it wouldn't have, it, it wouldn't I don't know have that it would have worked out as well. I don't think so. He's not the, I don't know if he's the culture center that Brunson is. Exactly, exactly. Man. We're, we're seeing more and more now how important that is. This may not get us a championship someday, it may, but it may not. Any way you look at it, it's just, we're in a better place culture-wise, and we're moving in that direction. Everybody sees it, especially us Nick fans, uh, but to be back to the finals, I mean, listen, the Celtics, you know, listen, as we're talking about this Drew Holiday, and I think they're going to finish them off Friday, by the way. I think they're going to sweep. Okay. Um, you know, I, I, I said to you last night <clears throat> that I felt like Dallas looked soft to me, you know? And when I saw that guy, I forget who was it. Who was it? Maybe it was that guy, that Xavier Tillman. Somebody got a dunk right down the middle. And I mean, right down the middle, man, in the third quarter. 
you know, when you needed to do something, you do something, you know? And they let this guy dunk right down the middle. And when it happened, Nick, I noticed this with teams sometimes. If it's a team where everybody cares and everybody's upset that that happens, they might look at each other like, yo, what the? You know, these guys, they did one of these, Nick. They wouldn't look each other in the eye. And they just want to act like everything's okay. And you know what? It's not okay. Not at all. <laughs> Nothing's okay right now. Nothing's, Nothing's okay right now. And we got to connect if we're going to make this right. We're not going to make this right if we're all playing like, individuals you know on the court you know like we're playing 21 or utah or something um you know come on man that's just that's softness man sorry and do we need to talk about jason kidd so there's if we gotta we, gotta, we need to talk about jason kidd um but we I'm also gotta give Missoula. we gotta give Missoula some credit both of us have the both of, both of us have been down on this guy at different mm-hmm, times mm-hmm. i mean he's he's definitely somewhat eccentric very authentic though in being who he is did you see the back and forth he had with the brazilian reporter about neymar and you know talking about comparing it to tatum and how you guys are so hard it was a it was very interesting if you haven't seen it definitely check it out mm-hmm. shows just like the type of mind this guy has and um you you know, I, he's clearly a very religious man. Did you see his comments about the royal family? Somebody asked him. Like if, the whole family. Somebody asked him if they if he knew that the royal family was in attendance. I guess they were in attendance for some sort of game, like the British royal family. And he said, "What royal family?" He said, um, "He said uh, 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 Mary, Joseph, and Jesus. That's the only royal family I know." Um, so, <laughs> <laughs> um, but uh, awesome. listen, man, you got to give this guy credit. They've, no they've, they've taken away the lob, which was a huge weapon for the Mavericks. The attacking wow. Luka on defense. I mean, and that's another thing is they have the type of team where they can say, hey, no matter who gets the ball and Luka's guarding them, go. Where it's spread out. And, you know, I think that Boston, they also look like a team who's lost the finals before. Mm-hmm. They understand mm-hmm. the moment and the they seriousness the of it, and understand. Like, I especially I noticed that with like with Tatum. Like I said earlier, the fact that he's not playing so well, but he's still finding other ways. You know, that game where he shoots terribly, he has nine boards, he has twelve assists. You know, uh, the way that he was playing through contact, and the way that they're the way that him and Jalen Brown are finishing at the rim, they're finishing. Mm-hmm. Like they understand yeah. the 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 seriousness and the toughness that this moment is going to take. Jalen Brown has been the best player in the series, in my opinion. Oh yeah. You know, and 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 I and I saw something that was really cool where um uh, uh Jorge Sedano was in um the huddle. They allow him to be in some of the huddles, and he was in the huddle. And one of the things that Jalen Brown said last night was, "Yo, it's time to graduate." Okay, like we, we've gotten to this point right now where we've gotten up here. No, it's time to go ahead and graduate to this next level and go ahead and close this out. And then obviously the the final culmination of winning that championship. And it seems like now that Marcus Smart is not there anymore, he's blossomed into even more of a leader that when they remember that they were the ones similar to Dallas that looked like they totally were not ready for a finals a few years ago against Mm -hmm. Golden State. And they clearly have learned a lot from that, and that is affecting how they are carrying Mm -hmm. themselves and the type of attention to detail and the type of force that they're playing with in this series. I think that that is is clear, man. It looks like they've been there before, and it looks like Dallas has not. Yeah, no doubt. Uh, They they are playing such great defense, team defense, you know, they're really bottling up and making things difficult for Luca and Kyrie. I remember how everybody was like, well, nobody can hold Kyrie. Nobody can hold Luca. Bullshit. People can say, and beyond just the team defense, Nick, I'm seeing a lot of excellent individual defense being played by the everyone on the team. Al the Horford. Team. Al Horford is moving his feet on Kyrie. It's a team concept, Nick. They yeah. clearly talk about it and coach this, and everybody plays hard and tough defense and you saw a lot of that frankly i hate to keep interjecting our boys but what the hell it's our show but you saw that with the with the knicks you know i mean and that's that's part of the culture change now i will say i think these guys are even they play better defense than the knicks obviously i mean they're there they if they win this game friday this year they're going to be 80 and 20 on the year that's flipping unbelievable Sure. Okay. That's an insane number. But yeah, their team defense against these guys. And, you know, I think what's hurt Luke and Kyrie more than anything is that these guys have made things very hard for them. This is a better defense than they met anytime in the West. Okay. And see, that's what I keep seeing that when people talk about the West being better than the East, 
well, you know, and I mean, mind you now, uh, Dallas didn't beat everybody, but they did beat the teams that really matter, right? They sure. beat Minnesota, who beat Denver, you know, and they beat Minnesota handily. It's all about matchups. Like, I think Denver would be actually giving the Boston a, a, a more of an issue um, yeah. in the finals. But, yeah, hey, they got to where – at the end of the day, they played who was in front of them, and they're in the championship. So that and is I think, I think I I think Denver might give them more of a challenge, but I think Boston would beat Denver. Yeah, yeah, so, yeah. I mean – We'll never know, but uh, – With Porzingis, they seem pretty yeah. unstoppable. You know, with yep. Porzingis, I mean, the 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 what that allows them to do spacing wise, and then his rim protection, which I feel like a lot of people lose sight. They think of him as some big guy who shoots threes. Uh, you know, us as Nick fans, we know Kristaps protects the rim. Okay, he, he he's a guy that if he's going to play big minutes, he's going to be league leader in the league, one of the league leaders in blocks, and and he's going, and it's not just a, he's not even like a like a Tyson Chandler guy who. I always thought he would get some blocks and, you know, he got all this pub and he won a defensive player a year with the Knicks. But when you really looked at it and watched him all the time, he wasn't a great defender. I, didn't think. I just, I just I don't know. think he was. And, um, you know, he was, a, he was very, he was decent at getting a couple of good weak side def, um, blocks every once in a while. Kristaps is not that Kristaps can hold his own in the paint and, you know, he can challenge at the rim. He moves his feet. He can run. He can do all those things, but uh, another lower foot injury. And now he's got a lower foot injury. That's one that is something that people are saying they've like Rare. never heard of. It doesn't even <laughs> like, so yeah, I mean, that guy, he's never going to be able to stay healthy, but you know, if he gets a ring this year and if the Celtics catch lightning in a bottle with him and they have a pretty deep team, they're, they're not really looking at any huge money situations coming up where they like have some young dude who's going to cost a bunch and they're going to have to you know kind of move guys around they're about to have to pay tatum yeah but i mean but they got his birds rights it's not they got i mean like it's gonna it's gonna be a huge deal it's gonna be a huge number but it's not gonna like affect i don't think they're gonna like pay tatum and now like you know they can't keep a guy like Derek white which Derek white this oh game God. is so solid Derek white solid. is 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 josh hart with a better three ball like if, if better josh, three ball and about two or three inches taller yes yes that part you know that guy's long man he gets in people's way you know, he's a baller, man. He's a ball player, man. He's so annoying to play really against. Is. He's, a, he's so, but, but he, that guy is just a basketball player. Great fit for that team. Exactly what that team needed. Um, you know, you gotta, you also gotta give them some credit for the moves that they made to, you know, add Porzingis, add Derek White. You know, you get rid of Marcus Smart, who everybody was like, oh, you can't get rid of him. He's the, he's the heart and soul of the team. But They're maybe better. they knew that Jalen Brown was ready to ascend into that role. And Jalen Brown, man, I can't be more impressed with him. The way that, you know, he not only has taken on the leadership role but he him and tatum do such a good job of making the correct play mm -hmm. they're not mm -hmm. like trading off like okay i'm gonna get off right now no you're gonna no they make the correct play all the time and even in even in you know game three where jalen brown throughout the first three quarters didn't seem like he was you know really getting it going offensively but he was doing other things he's played great defense throughout the entire series but then in the fourth quarter it's like whenever they needed a big shot that cat was cash man just like you know getting all the way to the rim 18 footer he's just doing his thing and yeah man i i don't know i i think that dallas is going to figure out a way to win one game i, I have a hard time believing this team, this team's going to get all the way to the finals and not at least win one game they come out nothing to lose i think that'll help them a little bit now like with just no pressure just come out and like as lucas said try to just kind of have fun but um i could definitely see the celtics you know putting it on them and i what i don't see is you know if they get up real big the celtics and especially since Dallas came back and got so close, but then wasn't able to finish it, I could see them kind of packing it in a little bit. Yeah. And, you know, the Celtics going ahead and running away with it. But it'll be interesting to see in game four. I'm hoping that they, you know, at least win a game and, you know, continue to push this series. But like we said, nobody's ever come back from 3-0, and I don't think this will be the first time. Um, I don't think that Dallas has a fight. You know, I think when they made that comeback yesterday, Nick, it was do or die right then. They had to win that game. And the fact that they didn't win it, Luca on the sideline, the fact that they didn't win it, it, it was such a deflator for them. And they realize what they're staring at now, being down 3-0. There's one other point I really wanted to make about that, um, about Boston. Can we stop constantly, like this stupid narrative that you've heard over the years, well, who's one and who's you know two on that team and who's this? I really feel like these two guys, don't give a shit about that at all. at all. I don't feel like 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 some people say, 
well, how's Jason Tatum going to feel if, if Jalen Brown wins the MVP? Look, Jalen Brown's been the MVP. I don't think Jason Tatum's going to give a damn. Nope. He's going to be happy that they win. You know, that's it. And um, I just feel like these two guys play together. I feel like they're two brothers who respect one another. And I feel like they're smart guys. They're not they're not all into their personal ego, man. Okay? And that's part of making the right play all the time, Nick. Yep. They don't care who scores. I see those guys pass to each other all the time when one could go ahead and shoot, but the other one's got a better shot. You know? And I just think that that – I think a lot of times, unfortunately, we as, um, you know, fans out here, and especially the greater press, they want to search for acrimony or, or issues and, 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 you know, inroads and problems and all that. And I, I don't think that – I honestly don't think that's happening here with this, with this team, with those two guys. And with um, our man, too, um, Holiday. You know what I mean? He's another guy, same mindset. Let's just win, man. Let's just win. You know? I love that. that that's impressive. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, listen, Brad Stevens, he stepped away from being the coach. He went into the front office and he's done a fantastic job. Exactly. And, you know, we've seen this team just continue to inch closer and closer. And it seems like this year they're finally going to be able to get it done. Um, shout out to my man, AJ. I was talking to him yesterday. He's a huge, huge Boston sports fan in general, but specifically the C's. And, um, you know, he, he said to, he texted me after the first quarter. He said to be down by one right now. I feel really good. I feel like we just took their best punch. Absolutely. And um, yeah, we watched Luca just you know continue to uh, really torpedo his team and then eventually give his team no shot by not even being on the floor in the last four minutes and now we you know have one more win for the Celtics and they get to be the champs and you know we get to deal with annoying Boston fans for you know the next year or so and um you know we'll, we'll see how it all plays out but uh, even with it being three to zero, there still has been some entertaining moments. Hopefully they give us a few more. Um, one other thing, just have to say, if, if um, we were, if, if Luca played for the Knicks, I mean, I got to think, 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 look, look, the guy's giving you a million thrilling moments. Right now in the finals, I cannot imagine how frustrated I'd be with this guy right now. If Luca played for the Knicks, your head if would he explode. Was your sir, my head would explode. <laughs> because you're you are Mr. Do not complain to the refs. And I mean, Luca is the worst about that. And he has been, I mean, he's had that, you know, that reputation for some time now. It's just oh yeah, 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 yeah. Which I didn't say, I mean, come on, LeBron, he's ranking up there, but this guy, he surpassed LeBron on this. I this saw game. somebody make a point the other day. They said, you know. Luca, he's kind of like the he's kind of molded himself after LeBron, whereas like you know Tatum and Jalen Brown, they're a little bit more like Kobeites, and you mm -hmm. know it's it's not just about you know both in in, in the way that they play and the way that they handle themselves, like mm -hmm. you know mm -hmm. it, it, it's just yeah man, it, it, it just I, I I almost like feel bad for. I feel I'm annoyed Kyrie. that the no, 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 I'm not not even Kyrie and Kyrie. Hey, he he finally, you know, came to the series and had a really big game in game three. They just weren't able to get it done, um, obviously. But he, he, you know, started off really hot and then he got a little bit, you know, I thought a little trigger that like that one and three that he took that pretty much sealed it when it was over. It was like a sidestep dribble fading away. And like Mike Breen even commented that, yeah, that was around the same area that, um, you know, yeah. he, he okay. made that shot that against. And I'm like, no, 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 Mike. And there was no. somebody this close to him. There was, a, there was, okay, one was against Al Horford fading away. And the other one was with, with, um, with uh, Steph Curry backing up and him right. being able to pull it. I mean, they're totally different shots. All right, Breen got the score wrong a couple times yesterday. I, I don't know. Breen, Breen was struggling last night. You know, I, yeah, I don't know what's going on. No, come on. You can't throw that on Breen. You always think anytime <laughs> anybody makes any mistake or looks the least bit like not themselves, you immediately go with, oh, he's drunk. <laughs> <laughs> Breen the booze hound. No, no, no. no. Breen's not boozing. Um, you know, he just made a couple mistakes. No big deal. Go no ahead, big deal. Vodka. You do better. Yeah, yeah, no, but yeah, well, it'll be interesting. What have you thought about uh, him, Doris, and JJ Reddick? I, you know, it's interesting you asked that. I had one guy at work say to me, "Oh my god, I can't stand the commentator." I'm like, what's so wrong? What's so bad about it? I don't hate he it. Said, I don't love it. He thinks JJ Reddick needs to speak more. <clears throat> I think you know, so. I, I think JJ Reddick needs to speak more. And I, what bothers me, and I, I listen, JJ Reddick's podcast. 
um, is one of my favorite podcasts. There is the old man and the three. Uh, he does great mm -hmm. breakdown, but like, you know, talks like a normal, regular guy. Um, but one of the things that I really don't like is that when they're going to like uh, a, a commercial break and they do like they have JJ Reddick, like talk about whatever has happened most recently. And he, he feigns <clears throat> excitement. It's very, it's, I hate that. I hate that. It, do, it doesn't, it, it's just not, you know, like they, they, they're, they're asking him to do the Mark Jackson thing. Right. Right. And, and he, and he's, it's, it's just not, it just doesn't work for him. It's not, it's, it's not, it's not, it's not the move. Well, I like Doris Burke. Okay, I like. I Doris know you like Doris. Doris. I, I, I don't know why man. some people are hating on Doris. I'm not a big now. Doris guy. Which, by I, the way, which by the way, I found out that she was a big time ball player herself. Yes, yeah, yeah, I didn't yeah. know that. But anyway, Doris I mean, I think what bothers a lot of people is that they're not Mark Jackson and Van Gundy. Yeah, and yeah, you know? and that's that the thing. Just, that's insane. Yeah, I mean, listen, it's the, yeah, the, the fact that that they weren't able to keep that together and work that out is it is insane to me. And um, you know, at least Breen is still there. Breen is always going to get bring a certain level of decorum and oh, no, no. um also entertainment no matter what. So um no matter who you put with him, though I don't love I don't love Doris and I think that um Reddick should he, 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 they, 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 I think he's still finding himself as an announcer, and that's totally, you know, he's been doing it for less than a season. So, you know, that's to be oh. expected. He's going to be leaving soon to go coach the Lakers, right? We shall see, and we will talk about the Lakers and their their um, coaching search a little bit later. But first, let's talk about Caitlin Clark, who continues to be in the news. The latest story and the one that is getting all of the attention now is her being left off the roster for the Paris Olympics coming up this summer. Now, there has been a bunch of opinion. <clears throat> the two major sides are she got snubbed and the side of, well, she's not one of the 12 best basketball players in the United States right now. So therefore she shouldn't be on the team. One argument being that it's not just that she got snubbed because, you know, she's not one of the 12 best, but that it is silly of the U S team to not capitalize on the popularity that she has and therefore put her on the team. What do you think about her not making the team? And um, what do you think about not only that decision, but what it means overall for this Olympics, Olympics and women's basketball? Um, I, I see both ways. I see both sides of the argument. But I also, look, um, I, and I was listening to um, <clears throat> Drea on ESPN. What's her name? That girl, Andrea, I forget her name. It's Carter. Anyway, she made a good point that just recently in, a, in some sort of play-in game, the U.S. only won by like five points, okay? Had to squeak out a win or maybe less than that, whatever. Mm -hmm. So they feel like they need players uh, and good players. Number two, though, Caitlin Clark isn't, you know, she's not going to affect the game much on the international level. The, they say the youngest player besides her would have been 26. They're, um, it's a much more physical game than even she's seeing now in the WNBA, which is clearly more, much more physical than college. And I do kind of see it, Nick, where, first of all, USA basketball, is their purpose, I mean, are, is their purpose the WNBA or is their purpose to make sure they win? Because everybody just says, oh, they're definitely gonna win, they're definitely gonna win. You know, when people start talking like that is when people lose, and that's what we've seen with the men, okay, when we talk like that. So it doesn't always work like that, as the rest of the world's getting better. <laughs> but also, I think this is a big point. If you had put Caitlin Clark on the team and she got maybe a couple minutes a game, because that's what she would warrant, Nick. She wouldn't warrant a starring role. Sure. Okay. If she gets now, that's gonna be a huge story as well. I understand why. I don't even want to deal with that if I'm USA basketball, especially if this girl, if I'm only putting her on a team for marketing purposes, that's not fair to her. Because also, too, this happens in the middle of the WNBA season. And the, all these girls, all these women on the, w, on the women's team, a lot of them have been practicing together. A lot of them practiced together before the WNBA season because they weren't in college. She has not practiced with them 
at all. Right. She so was not. She, she wasn't able to try out. Right. So she would have to be interjected into it. And listen, it, it may happen. She's one of the top two alternates. Sure. So it may happen anyway. I don't think it's that big a deal. I don't think this is the other thing I think. I don't think it has anything to do with Caitlin, Play, Caitlin Clark personally. She's no. not bitching about it. She hasn't said a word. She's handled it like an absolute pro and just said, no big deal. And just move on, girl, and just do your thing. You know, and I, I like it that she's the way she's handling it. And um, I just don't think it's that big a deal. I think more people are making a bigger deal out of it than it really is. I mean, you know. So I agree with you that I can see both sides of the argument. And, mm. I, and I think it really comes down to what is Team USA's mission? Like if you're the person that's at the top of Team USA, you know, if you're at the top of any organization, you have some sort of mission statement. And is that about going out there and winning this tournament at all costs? Or is do you feel like your purpose is to grow the game in the United States? Right. And if your purpose is to grow the game in the United States, then you should have put her on the team, in my opinion. Okay. Just because it, we can't deny the amount of eyes and the amount of popularity that she has brought to the women's game, first college and now the WNBA, hasn't always been for the best reasons. And we'll get into that a little bit more. But like, I just feel like I honestly think that you should have put her and Angel Reese on the team. If, if that's what if you're if you if, if your your goal is to grow the game just because that would get the most eyes those are the two most popular players in the WNBA right now whether we like it or not and there is precedent here Tarasi Parker Stewart all made Olympic teams as rookies where they you know uh, didn't really have the you know the accolades to really say that this is somebody that should be on the team we know that they did that with Kristen Chris, with Christian Leitner back in the um you know in the in the dream team so on both sides we do have you know precedents where we've seen young play that one young player that you throw on the team and I think it would have actually been good for her in a sense of spending time with all these people and building some camaraderie with them, especially with how, you know, she, it seems like she's been, um, you know, how she's been, um, you know, taken in as far as the league so far. And um, also I think though, for her personally, I think it'll be actually a little bit better for her to get some time off just because of how the, 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 the college season goes right into the WNBA season. And mm -hmm. she's got so much, you know, pressure and so much eyes on her all the time. And, and time I think with her teammates, you know, time with the Indiana fever, Nick, I mean, you talk about them getting close to the guys, uh, the, the, the other women on the um, Olympic team, but you know, I'm sure they'll, you know, practice together, especially a team that's losing as much as they are. What in this little break is can be like a mini camp. My my guess would be that the players association would somehow make it so that the teams cannot practice together during that time span because then that would be an unfair advantage to do to to the uh, a dis, an unfair disadvantage to the players that are off in Paris and playing in those particular teams. That's just a guess. I don't know anything about how that was bargained, but that would be my guess on that. Um, but. One thing that I found interesting, because we talked about Caitlin Clark last week, and I made a reel, um, you know, with us talking about the the way that, you know, she's been getting these hard fouls and whether or not she's been bullied since she's been in the WNBA. And, you know, it had almost 7K views and it had 40 comments. And it was interesting because as I'm sitting there and I'm going through the comments, uh, you know, uh, one comment just said, racist, black, jealous lesbians. And many of the comments were exactly that. Out of the 40, I would say 25, 30 of them were, this is because it's racist. They're being racist. They don't like the fact that she's a straight white female. And I replied to many of those and said, why didn't Ionescu, Stewart, Deladon, Tarasi, Bird, why didn't any of them get any of this same treatment? You know, they're um, you know, they're all uh, young white females. I don't know if I don't know about, you know, their sexual preference when it comes to all of them. But um, yeah, I, I just I just think that it's so interesting how polarizing these, you know, different arguments can get. And I think it's a it's a societal issue that we have and an issue as a nation that we have right now. But um, I saw L. Duncan on the Dan Levitard show. And she was talking about this. She leads up the studio show for the WNBA right now on ESPN. And she had done college women's. And then they just now this season decided to go ahead and bring her over and have her do with the WNBA. And, um, you know, she, she she's the Malika Andrews of that show. She runs the show. And I thought that she had such a great quote 
when talking about it, she said, it's become like everything else in this country, a total and complete culture war where everybody that's new to the party is showing up with pitchforks. And that's the thing. One of the guys who even responded to me when I said, when I, when I, you know, kind of pushed back on him saying that it was all about race. And it was really, I listen, if that's your opinion, that's fine. But he said it in a way that kind of just, you know, it kind of put on blast the type of the person he is. And he said, well, yeah, I never watched before this. And it's like, it's just like so many things, the people that are on the fringes are always the loudest. And they're coming in and they they want to say it's all about this or it's all about that. And it's like, yo, you don't even watch the game. Like you're, you're not even actually a student of this sport and of this game. So you're saying that it's this. But you when I say what hap- what about these other people, you don't even know how we're talking about because you don't know any of the history. And I don't know WNBA aficionado, but I do just think it is a it's a microcosm of our entire society. The way that this particular issue has been so divisive and everybody feels like they have to pick a side. Yeah, I mean, it's silly, you know. I, I mean, it, it really is sad and silly, but, you know, I mean, listen, does race play a part? Race plays a part in almost everything in this country, right? Sure. But I don't know if it is the overriding factor. And I could see, like you said, the people who are new to the new to the arena, they, they, they might latch on to that because it's easiest for them, because it's how they feel, you know. But, um, you know, I, I think more, you, you, we're going to see that clearly she gets along with everyone, and there are a lot of people who get along with her. This is not going to be an ongoing. This, I don't believe this could be an ongoing racial issue in the game. Okay, that that's silly. And if it were in fact truly a racial issue right now, it would be ongoing. Okay, it wouldn't just change. Right. You know. So, but I just don't think it's. I mean, I don't think that's as big a percentage. Okay, it's a small per, part of this, a very small part of this, and I don't think it's going to grow in that respect. Yeah, I don't think so either. Let's hope not. What did you think of uh, Dan Hurley rejecting the Lakers to stay in Connecticut? Hey, I get it, man. I mean, look, you know, hey, you and I can both attest, going from the East Coast to the West Coast, very different thing, right? Very different lifestyle, all that. His wife and kids, they love it over there. I get that. It's a big part of your decision. Um, listen, this is the other thing. You could go to the Lakers and very well go to the Lakers right now with the team that they have. Their cap situation, you're not winning anything. Not winning anything. You're lucky to get in the playoffs next year if AD, AD stays healthy. And going forward, you've got no – you've got a bleak – an empty cupboard and a bleak outlook. What about Rui Hachimura? Right, Rui Hachimura or Austin Reeves. Austin Reeves. Right. I mean, listen, they're good players and whatnot, but they're not going to – you know, they're not going to beat you when you're playing against Luka, okay? Right. But, no, um, seriously. Um I get it, man. And I think he did the right thing for himself and for his family. Um, I could see how you might want to go over it. I did think that the numbers they were going to throw at him were going to be larger than what they all Dad, that's one of my biggest points in this whole thing. When you're trying to lure the guy, the, the guy who is the who is the man who's got the perfect situation. He's just won back-to-back championships. He's got the perfect situation. He's a Jersey kid who now he's in Connecticut. He's right right around the way from where he's, you know, where he's from. You know, he's got his favorite bagel spot, his favorite pizza spot. And he's built a powerhouse that seems to be, that just lost players. And then it's not like Florida where they just brought back the exact same guys Mm -hmm. and they won a a championship. He, he, actually rebuilt it and they say that you know they're primed to be able to do it again or at least compete going into next season the only way that you get that guy to jump ship is you throw a dollar amount at him where he's like yo i i can't you know damn man can we say no to this and that's the only way that you do that they were going to try to make him the seven highest paid coach when you go get that guy from college, when they went and got Billy Donovan, going back to getting Rick Pitino, the way that you get those guys to come out is you co- you bring them in and you make them the highest paid coach in the league right then and there. As they say, you got to money whip them, man. You and, got you know, to. That's the they, only, That's the only. like you said, it's a everything about his UConn situation is better. The only way that you're able to get to a point where you make this guy even consider it is you throw a bag at him. And I just thought that it was insane much, that they were trying to make him the seventh or eighth paid head coach. How much does he make right now at UConn? Well, that's the thing is that he is, he's, he's in the midst of trying to get a, um, a new will. contract and he's about to get upgraded. And I honestly, dad, I know that he would never admit this. I know he's come out and said the exact contrary, 
I think that the whole flirting with the Lakers was just to put a little bit of pressure on the people at UConn and make sure y'all understand that y'all y'all need to come with the correct dollar amount. I don't think that. But I don't immediately go for the juicy. Uh, uh, what's the name? I mean, the Lakers were pursuing him. So what are you saying to me now? The Lakers weren't really pursuing him. No, no, that was him. That was him pursuing them. No, 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 no. I think well, when the, the Lakers that come to him, with them. yeah, that he flirted with them. I mean, he could have easily said, like, no, I'm good. And that's it. But the fact that he goes out there and he's getting interviewed and everybody knows about it and all that, you know that UConn boosters and shit were, like, looking at each other like, yo, what yo, what do we got to do? We can't let this oh, guy get away. He's not stupid, Nicky. Yeah, I, mean, if, I think if, he's if just he that opportunity, his, his, his agent said to him, you should take the interview. And he said, yeah. And you know what, Nick? I mean, why not? I mean – you know what, man? I'm just saying that I don't think he was ever see. I don't think that he ever w it was serious about ever going to the Lakers. I, oh, I, I and this is totally that. just a guess. This is totally just a guess. Exactly. How would we know that? I don't, I don't know. You don't know. What, right. Ninety percent. If I say I mean, it's just a guess, that some shit I, don't I know, know, but I'm not assuming that the man. Because to me, that's a little underhanded. If he was went through this whole thing, yeah, he wasn't going to do that. No, it's underhanded to the Lakers to make them put themselves out. I mean, like it's that. the old, it, it happens all the time in sports, both with players and coaches. I know. I don't. I don't think he did that, but I don't know. I, I'm not going to. Eh, I just. I don't like assuming the worst in people. If I have no reason to believe that, and what all I've seen from this guy is that he's a good guy and an exemplary guy. So I'm not I, I think he could be all of those things. Um, be a good guy and still yeah, have true. used the Lakers for a little bit of leverage to get a little bit of extra cheddar out of UConn. Uh, the Jets. They had their mandatory meeting camp. Aaron Rodgers and Hassan Reddick were both absent. Hassan Reddick, uh, you know, we did think that he was going to make it to the mandatory camp. He's put out some tweets about not believing narratives. Obviously, the Jets are, you know, working with him to try to get a deal done. We'll see how that plays out once we get to, you know, actual camp. Rodgers was not there. It was an inexcused absence, which is what was said initially. And then, I don't know, Salah kind of backtracked. He's been getting a lot of heat in the media for the handling of these press conferences these last couple of days. Um, what do you think of Roger's absence and, you know, the way that Sala has handled it in the media? Um, I, I'm not, a, I'm not all worked up about uh, Roger's absence. I mean, clearly it's something that they knew about. I don't understand why they didn't, they didn't just say, listen, it's an excused absence. We, we've made this plan and blah, blah, blah. Because ultimately for all of us out here in Jetsland, it's the same effect. I mean, in fact, that would just make things easier. I don't give a shit if he's getting fined because we know these fines are going to work out one way or another or go to charity. I don't care about that. Um, I think it would have just been smarter, and I don't understand why anyone wouldn't have thought that from the start, that, hey, let's just say it's an excused absence or whatnot. But I think it also flies in the face of the narrative that, like, Aaron Rodgers runs this team. If Aaron Rodgers ran, ran the team, then none of this would be even talked about as inexcused. It would just be... Aaron has something else to do, a pressing family matter or something like that, and blah, blah, blah. And, you know, listen, nobody knows what he's doing. People are, uh, you know, speculating it's a ayahuasca retreat or whatever. No one knows what he's doing. It might be something that's really important to him personally. I hope it is. Whatever it is, even if it's an ayahuasca retreat, whatever it is, it's important to him. Right. As long as he came to the team and explained it beforehand, which clearly right. he did, and they knew right. he wasn't going to be there. I, my my biggest issue with all that, I don't care that he's not there. The guy's been at every single thing. The fact that he wasn't there for two days, I don't care. It was just two days? This yeah. Week? Okay. Yeah. Not a big but um, maybe, maybe three, but I'm pretty sure it's just two days. Okay. My issue is Salah. I mean, come on, guy. Like, I don't understand. He, he, that he, you know, okay, you're, you're an NFL coach, okay? You're going to have to be in front of a mic. You're going to have to speak. You happen to coach a team in New York with Aaron Rodgers as the quarterback. So there's going to be even more microscope and more people looking and paying attention to what you say. You know that you're going to get asked this when you go up. It's going to be the first question. I thought his answer just showed such a lack of awareness for the entire situation and then his response the next day, it's like, is anybody coaching this guy up on how to deal with the media? And really, I'm sorry, but this is not something where you need some public relations person to sit you down and explain this to you. No. You know that there is what you have to answer this in a way that ends the conversation. 
Instead, he answered it in a way that opened up and amplified the conversation. And you know that it's, dude, it's, it's the time of the year where nobody's got anything to talk about, man. Like, come on, dude. I just, I, I was just, I, I was disappointed in Salah in the way that he handled that. And, you know, the thing that has always been the question with him is the job too big for him. Is he not, is he a great coordinator, but he's not head, he's not head coach material. And this is now a few different times where he has handled a, press conference in a way that I'm sure he wishes and all Jets fans wish they could take back. Yeah, no, it's not a good look. And the, the, the sad thing about it is, Nick, is that, you know, previous to this little mess up, he's all, he's been very good with the press and very good in those press conferences. I mean, decent enough, but for him to do this, it's almost like he's new again with this. Right. You don't expect right. this from him now. He's been on the job for three years now. Right. Handle it, brother, handle it. And, you know, he didn't handle it well, and he could just be better or, or, you know, I mean, listen, I do have to talk about it and talk about it wisely so that, you know, and Nick, to me, when you're, when you're him, when you give answers, you always have to be thinking about next question and, you know, in your mind as you're giving the answer, because you have to know what you're feeding them, what they're going to come back with. And he just hasn't done a good job of that here. He, he could do a lot better. He could do a lot better. You know, I'm a solid guy. But you're right. He could do a lot better here, and he needs to. Or go full Belichick, which you can't go that route now where you just don't answer questions because that's not who you've been. So you can't change up. That Belichick shit, Belichick. Only worked for him. But, but yeah, but. And, and it didn't even really work. It worked when he was winning. Exactly. Before they were winning, he wasn't doing that shit. He started. Yeah. He, he started doing that shit. He was. He was. He wasn't like Mister Colorful. But that's that one word answer where he clearly just has total disdain for the media. He started doing that shit after they were winning. That's when you can do shit like that. You can't do that when you know you're you're you're, you're Robert Sala and you know your job is on the line and half the NFL and you know former employees of yours. Like I told you, my guy told me his former employee that you know worked very like. It was really worked in the Jets organization and no longer does. And is now working with another very prestigious organization said that Salah is an absolute clown. He's been around multiple organizations and he's a clown. And there's a whole lot of people that feel that way. You're very pro Salah. I am still maybe in this corner. Maybe your boy's boy is a, is a disgruntled employee. Yeah. When I tell you the team that he's on now and the person who hired him, I think that that'll change your opinion a little bit. That it gives gives me a little bit of pause. Um, you know, so, so let's just say a team that somebody that we both know very much follows. That's the team that he's on now. If you catch my drift, um, so you know I, they don't usually mess up too often. But anyways, I just you know I I, I was hoping for better out of Salah. You know, this is obviously a make or break year for everybody in the Jets organization and it's OTAs and he's already, you know, fumbling press conferences. He's got to be better. He's just got to be better. And hopefully it'll be a learning experience. Hopefully they will. I hope that they have somebody talking to him and coaching him up on how to deal with these situations. And I hope that he has just a little bit more, you know, understanding of awareness moving forward. Yeah, hopefully they're in the film room going back and forth on and saying, look, right here, right here. What are you doing? What are you doing? <laughs> uh, the Mets, they went to London. They split a two-game series against the best in league, best in MLB, uh, Philadelphia Phillies. And now they have come back and split the first two games against the Miami Marlins. Um, they continue to give us just enough to, you know, have some interest and, um, you know, some days things look terrible. I got on, uh, the, 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 the post-game stream with my guy CPNY on, um, you know, uh, uh, Mets talk live the other day after they lost that first game back from London and, you know, in the comments section, everybody's so doom and gloom. I didn't quite go that far. I did say that I thought that we needed to switch up the lineup and that we needed to get Nimmo out of the um, out of the, the 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 number three spot. Yesterday we put up a ten spot with Nimmo sitting down in that game. Now today, and what I asked for, um, you know, in the in, in the it was that that Nimmo be brought to the two spot because I don't see him as we can't take Lindor out of the leadoff spot, and mm -hmm. I don't really see where else you put Nimmo. And it seems like somebody was listening to the pod because Nimmo is in the two spot today after the day off yesterday. JD Martinez is in the three, and I also railed about the fact that listen, I'm almost forty, I'm old, I don't care about this newfangled putting your hitter in the two spot. Pete Alonso is 
he is a cleanup hitter, period. Put him in a cleanup spot and leave him there. And that's where he's been the last two days. And, um, you know, that's what I like to see. But, I, again, I like the fact that this guy, Mendoza, is willing to shake it up. And, you know, we're going to see if the Mets can catch lightning in a bottle. And like you have said many times, just stay close, make the run at the right time, and sneak in. Yeah, no, uh, 1-0 right now, by the way, bottom of the six. Um, we're down 1-0. Um, yeah, no, I, I think the Mets can, um, oh, listen, just like we say, just stay consistent. I was, uh, you know, I, I'm very happy to see the way we're playing. We're playing with a little more, you know, get up and go. Um, this guy, the second baseman, what's Iglesias? Iglesias. has been great. Um, you know who's been really good, man? Vientos has been fantastic. Yo, Vientos has great. the highest OPS of any player in the major leagues since he's, um, since, he since he's, since he's come up and he, he's, I mean, he's, he's like leading. His fielding has been pretty good, even though in the game, you know, that first game back against the Marlins, he did have a play where he made a great pick, but then made a terrible throw. And that yeah. led to them uh, having a somewhat big inning. But yeah. yeah, man, Vientos is not going anywhere, as I've said before on this, yeah. uh, on this pod, like, especially if he's continuing to improve with the glove as well. But I mean, his bat right now has just been unbelievable. And you got to love what you see from him. He was upset that he got sent down. And he's come up and he's done everything he can. I don't know what happens to Brett Beatty. I have no idea because J.D. Martinez is going to be your DH every single game. And I don't really care what happens to Brett Beatty at this point. Vientos is hitting 313. He's got a 941 OPS. Yo, this guy is going to play and he's going to continue to move up in the lineup. Right now, tonight, they got him hitting sixth. Um, you know, they got Marte hitting fifth, him hitting sixth. And then, you know, I think it's really important that we've been able to get our guy Alvarez back. He gives yes. us just a little bit more juice, man. You can yes. feel it. And, you know, we were playing better. You look at our record with him this season, obviously in a small sample size. We were, you know, above 500. We were playing better baseball. And now that he's back, hopefully, you know, that that, that trend can continue and we can, uh, you know, give us a summer of uh, interest at least. I hope so. I mean, you know, I love what I'm seeing from a few of these guys. So it's very exciting. Um, you know, we just we have to put it together. And, you know, Sugar's back. We're, we're, we're calling him Sugar again for now. Call him Sugar. You know, we're calling him Sugar. We, we, we believe in you, Sugar. Come on. Stay sweet. Stay sweet. Uh, but we, we, we need him to come up big in, in the late, late part of the game. <laughs> you like that one. We, we, we need for him to come up big in the late part of the game because, I mean, that's been our downfall. You know, Drew Smith has surprised me. Listen to me. There's this one reliever guy. I don't know who he is, Nick. What's his name? Um, it's a Hispanic guy, tall guy. He's been lights out when he comes into the game, man. Electric stuff. Um, Udell, I forgot his name. Nick. I can't remember his name, but man, oh, man, a Chevitz. This guy, I watched him pitch the other night, and I was so impressed with him. And I've seen him at least two times now in relief situations Middle inning, like sixth, seventh inning relief, where he's mowed down like five, four. Five, I know who you're talking four. about. You're talking about Nunez. Nunez, that's his last name. It's Daniel D E D N I E L. Who knows what the fuck that is? Right, right. But Nunez. Um, Nunez. Uh, his stuff is electric, man. And he's another guy. Okay, he's another I mean, guy who. It's like whoa. Well, that you know that that was the that was the thing that was the question was okay you know we're gonna bring back up Edwin Diaz who's getting sent out this or that and it's like yo. Some guy young got set down. Yeah, really young got young. bounced because it can't be Nunez. A no. lot of people are, are screaming that it's got to be Adovino. You know, he's got an ERA over six right now. Adovino's a shit this year. He's been terrible. Yeah, and, you know, that guy, I've always liked him. I've always had faith in him that he sucks this year. Okay, so, you know, I, I'm i sorry, Adovino. You know, this guy, he's coming out gotta there. Go. He, He's always he's always getting him himself in a position where he's behind in the count and then has to deliver up the meatball, and guys are just like, oh, there it is. Oh, yeah. yo, he's got, yeah, he's got to be better. But yeah, I listen, the, the Mets, they continue to give us a reason to be able to pay attention and have some optimism, which is all we ask for this season. Um, and then, you know, it, it'll be interesting just to see, you know, how this plays out. And then obviously the deadline is going to be a big deal and and how we handle that. But that's all to be seen. We, you know, we'll, we'll get there when we get there. Just, uh, you know, another game every day. That's what baseball is, right? Every day. Mr. Clutch, Jerry West. Mm. He passed away peacefully from natural causes at 86 years old. His long list of accomplishments, they include nine NBA finals as a player. He was only able to win one. Shame to go against those uh, Bill Russell Lakers all those years. It's a little Knicks, a little Knicks uh, mixed in there as well. 
Um, All-star in all 14 years of his NBA career. Mm -hmm. 12-time All-NBA. Five-time All-Defense. He won the MVP in a losing effort in both college and in the NBA. Mm. I knew that he had won it in the NBA. I didn't know I that didn't he know won it. Go. He did as well in college. West Virginia, um, right? Yeah, West Virginia. Um, eight rings as an executive and obviously is considered one of the greatest talent evaluators of all time. And, of course, inspired the iconic NBA logo. What are your thoughts on Jerry West? Obviously, an all-time great, an icon in the sport. Um, he deserves all the accolades he gets. He's clearly an excellent judge of talent. We, we, we can go on and on about his actual talent on the court, which was just phenomenal. But Do you he, remember seeing him play a lot? Very Not little. too much? Very little when I was young, okay? Like, I remember that 73 championship a little bit. You know, I would talk about with your Aunt Pat, you know, because she was into it. But very little about Jerry West because he stopped playing soon after that, I believe. If he played, what year did he stop playing? I'd like to know. Um, but he's um, he was an icon, and you know he just seemed to be a great judge of talent. And listen, you know it's not a coincidence that everybody who speaks about this guy has high things to say about him as a person, as his personal character. Well, you except know? for the writers of that uh, that that Lakers show. Right, 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 right. He's not happy with them, and yeah, they, they, they want to spice it up a bit. So they made him seem a little worse, right? Um, but in any case, look, I, I take the word of all these people who played with him, worked with him, dealt with him, press, everybody. People wouldn't be falling over themselves to say all that they said if he was a closet asshole. You know, I, they just wouldn't be. Well, I've heard many people say that he was a very serious dude, that he had a bit of a mean streak, um, that, you know, like an angry streak. Like I, but, but at the same time, you know, I haven't heard anybody say that he was just an out and out asshole. You know what I mean? Right. And I think that you can, especially if you're going to be a high level athlete, like he was, you're going to have to have a little bit of a mean streak and a little bit of a, you know, be, I, I kind of, I, I, you know, that, that to me kind of makes sense. And, um, so I don't, you know, they, yeah, he, he seems like a guy who obviously has gotten just a ton of nice words spoken about him since he's passed. He is, his accolades across the board. Is he, is he the most, is he the most like decorated basketball player of all time? If you consider like both what he did in college, the NBA, and then as an executive, some of his highlights as an executive, the ones that, uh, you know, that, that I really like, I love the whole saga with KG wanting to go to the Lakers, the Lakers trying to get him. But at the time, the GM of Minnesota was Kevin McHale and him mm. kiboshing the deal. Cause he's like, I'm not, I'm not giving the Lakers this guy. Can we, can you imagine Kobe and, and KG playing together, the, the defensive intensity and just the overall intensity of that squad? I mean, that would have been something really, really cool to watch. But then he's not a, they're not able to get him. He goes to Boston. Obviously, they win a championship in Boston and they beat the Lakers to do so. But then you have Jerry West as the GM of the Memphis Grizzlies at the time, and he trades them Pau Gasol. For Marcus All, actually, Marcus All was on the Lakers. They had he hadn't played for the team yet. They still, but they had his rights. And Pau Gasol ends up being the Robin that Kobe needed to go and win another two championships. So I love just that whole thing and how that all played out. I think that's a cool story. Mm -hmm. Something that I saw that was really cool was that a lot of people know that he really engineered the whole Kobe to the Lakers thing. Not just mm -hmm. in the fact that he traded up to be able to get him, but that he then did certain things to try to make sure that he fell to a pick where he was going to be able to get him. I heard the other day that he did a very similar thing with SGA going to the Clippers. That he wow. was able to draft him 11th or 12th or whatever it was because he, you know, asked him maybe to not do a couple workouts and, you know, maybe he, he put out some information that he wasn't that great or whatever, because he thought he was going to be that good. And then the other thing that I love is that he threatened to quit the Warriors when he was working in their front office, he threatened to quit when they were all sitting down talking about possibly trading clay for Kevin Love. Mm. He said, absolutely not. You cannot do that. You cannot split up these two kids. And, you know, he saw the vision before the, um, you know, everybody else could and was like, do not make that move. And we know that that was 
clearly a great move for them not to make. And, you know, it's little stories like that that you hear about this guy. The whole thing about being the logo, the, 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 a lot of people don't realize this guy hit one of the greatest shots of all time. And if it, there was a three point line, it would have mm -hmm. been a game winning shot to be able mm -hmm. to get the game to um, overtime in the finals against the Knicks, right? That was in, that was the, I think so, yes. Yeah, yeah and so, that, yeah. in 73. And yeah, you are right. His last year was 73, 74. So he only played one more season after that. He only mm -hmm. played 31 games that year. So it looks like he started to get dinged up a little bit. But um, yeah, man, 12 time All Star, an All Star, I'm sorry, a, a, um, a 14 time All Star, all 14 years of his NBA career. I think right. that's awesome as well. That means that, you know, there wasn't a whole lot of falling off. No. And um, I saw a quote that I thought was pretty cool. I thought it was funny. It said that, uh, Jerry West went ahead and kicked the bucket because he would rather die than see the Celtics win another championship. <laughs> that sounds about right. You know, come on. There could be no no bigger rival. I mean, listen, the guy, you know, nothing but good things to say about Jerry West. Sad to see him go, you know, it's a loss for the league and, you know, definitely a loss for the sport. In his 86 years, he surely gave the sport of basketball all he possibly could. Can you imagine making it to nine straight finals and only winning one? I mean, the, the, the type of fortitude that that takes. And, um, yeah, man, just a, just an all-time great basketball man. The thing I like about it, though, is he made it to nine, only lost, only won one. Nick, if somebody did that now, he'd get ripped. He well, they say, they say LeBron reached out to him after um, they lost to Dallas. Right. I get and, it. And, and, you know, and LeBron, and he said, he said, he said to him, he said, you know, all the accolades, all I have, he says, I'm still motivated today by some of those losses. He said, there's still some of those losses where if you look at it, like he lost like multiple game sevens, a few of them by like only like two points. And he says, I still replay them all the time in my head. Of course. We all, anybody who's played any athletics or played in any games, you remember the losses more than you do the wins. Obviously. Always. You know, because they bother you. And clearly with a guy like that, I mean, to an ultra level, but um, yeah, man, I, 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 and that's what I'm saying to you, Nick. There's too much vilification and too much, you know, trying to make people into, you know, if if he had done what he did in his career now, I don't know, he would be heralded. I mean, 14 straight All Star games, but being to nine champion championship rounds and only winning one, come on, man, you get ripped for that now, and that sucks because it's not all about one person, which I always say it's not tennis. Come on. Catch us every week on YouTube or wherever you find your podcasts. Please follow, like, comment, and subscribe, and make sure you hit that notification button on all platforms. Really appreciate all the love. You can find us on all socials at he underscore did this to me. Love you, big guy. Love you, kid. <laughs>